Okay, let me start. Um, thank you again for, thank you Sandy for the previous talk and thank you all for attending this workshop. Um, today I'm going to talk about uh, physically realizable quantum algorithms. And uh, as you know, there have been uh, tremendous advancements in quantum computing both from hardware and algorithmic perspectives, but there are several challenges in the road ahead. And in this talk, I'll try to focus on some of the main algorithmic challenges due to the quantum nature of the hardware. Uh, this is a joint work with uh, Anand, Wojtek, and Aaron. And I'll try to start uh, with a very brief uh, history of um, quantum computing. I'll try to start the talk very elementary and then I'll bring in new stuff. And please feel free to ask me any questions if you have. Okay, so as you know, um, the first ideas of uh, quantum computing was proposed by Manning, Feynman, and Benioff in 1980s. And it was almost a decade after where we had uh, first generations of quantum algorithm and first more concrete models of quantum computing, notably the Shor's factoring algorithm, the Grover search algorithm, and many other well-known approaches here. And later on in 1997, we had the early two qubit quantum computer. And it was uh, not only until 2001 where we had a seven qubit quantum computer uh, capable of running the Shor's algorithm for factor number 15. So this was kind of the uh, first prototype of a quantum computer with a uh, quantum algorithm on that. Since then, there have been uh, several attempts and uh, extensive research in this topic. Uh, for instance, recently, IBM announced a 100 qubit uh, chip. And uh, it is expected uh, for these companies to go beyond uh, the 1,000 qubit uh, barrier. But I should note that uh, the current technologies are not yet fully fault tolerant uh, because of the many difficulties in maintaining the qubits there are, we are in the near term or NISC era. So we have a long road to achieve the fully fault tolerant quantum computing. Now here is a very um, crisp um, architectures, different, different architectures that are already proposed for quantum computing. So they are, they are both from um, hardware. So for instance, many big companies are working on superconducting quantum computers. Some are working on uh, the quantum dot model or Trapion model and many other models. There are also several works on, at the algorithmic level for the programming these computers and so on. Um, so, but, but among these different uh, quantum computing architectures, one leading one is the uh, based on the logical uh, gates. So in this approach, basically the quantum computer can be modeled by a quantum circuit consisting of several uh, small gate operations. These gate operations could be single qubit or two qubit operations. And here, here is a, a very simple uh, picture of uh, such a circuit. So the input, as you can see, is going to be a series of uh, qubits. And then we're going to have a series of quantum gate operations. At the end of the story, we would like to have a classical output. Therefore, at the end layer, we perform quantum measurements. So these quantum gates, you can think of them as the analog of uh, the logical gates in classical computers. But now, because we are performing measurements due to the stochasticity of the measurements, the output of the algorithm is not going to be deterministic. Rather, it's going to be probabilistic. So each time we run the same algorithm with the same output, we may get different answers. And typically we like to rerun the algorithm many times in order to uh, find the correct answer with high probability. So, but why quantum computing in general is important uh, because of three main reasons that I summarized below. First is that we would like to use quantum computers to speed up classical problems. For instance, the integer factoring, which is suspected to be NP problem, uh, is the one that classically, if you would like to um, 
have the integer factoring for a number with d digits, that's going to be almost exponential. However, with the Shor's algorithm, it's going to be polynomial in the number of digits with the use of a quantum computer. And this is very important because it's going to have consequences in many other problems involving security, encryptions, and many other problems. There are also several uh, other quantum algorithms that gives us exponential or polynomial advantages. For instance, the Simons problem where we get uh, exponential advantage in terms of query complexity. And also in terms of the Grover search problem, for instance, where we would like to find the one particular element inside the unstructured n element data set. So classically, this requires order of n number of operations, whereas with Grover search, we can reduce it with order of s square root of n. So these are sort of problems that we can think of uh, in terms of SVDA. Another line of advantages are the fact that quantum computers can leverage quantum information. So this is a kind of information uh, that can be appear in optical systems or in sensors with quantum effects. And this is a kind of information that is not accessible to classic computers. So there is no computational advantage talking about here. It's more about quantum information, which is not available to classical computers. And uh, along this line, now we can talk about also simulating quantum physical processes. And this is exponentially hard for classical computers because the dimension of the system grows exponentially with the number of particles. And that has a wide range of applications, uh, for instance, simulation in chemistry, drug discovery, the quantum many body system, and even social sciences. And in all of these problems, for instance, one leading application is to have better catalysts for fertilizer production by better simulating uh, the underlying molecules using quantum computers. And the third uh, line of advantage is enhancing learning models. And uh, this is due to resources such as entanglement using which quantum computers can explore larger classes of probability and therefore enhance learning models. There are also several works in this line. And, uh, but currently there are also challenges in this approach. Uh, notably, the current challenge is that it's, it's typically very hard to read classical data into a quantum computer. And some of these pre prior works require uh, that the data has been already input to quantum computer. So there are a lot of problems here to be resolved. So now among these challenges, now I can mention a few. For instance, we have uh, qubit decoherence. So this is due to the fact that um, quantum qubit uh, is a very fragile part of the nature and it's very hard to maintain qubits for a long period of the time. And after a very short period of the time, they start interacting with the environment and they lose their properties. This is important for a quantum computer because it would like the coherence time to be longer than all the gate operations. And uh, we would like to maintain this quantum property for qubit. Another challenge is about infidelity. So current uh, quantum operations, as I mentioned, are erroneous. We are in the NISC era. And uh, we have the scalability challenge. Um, so the number of qubits that we can maintain in a quantum device is very low. So we would like to increase this in order to take advantage of quantum computing. And lastly, we have the issue of a speed. The op no, operations per seconds are low at this point. So we would like to increase that in order to be able to compete with classical computers. And uh, there are several approaches addressing some of these challenges. One is based on hardware, where we would like to have better hardware for, with higher fidelity, with longer coherence time. We may also want to use quantum error correcting codes in order to combat the erroneous operations or uh, erroneous uh, uh, qubits that we are getting. And ideally, we would like to have the fault tolerant quantum computing. And another line of approaches is at the algorithmic level. So it turns out that some of these challenges that I mentioned can be resolved at the algorithmic level 
because some of these uh, properties, for instance, the infidelities, can be modeled as an extra sources of randomness or noise. And these sources of randomness and noise can be handled at the algorithmic level. Um, on top of these challenges, these things, we have also need to make sure that these algorithms are uh, complying with the quantum mechanical postulates, for instance, a no colony principle or classes of quantum states after measurements. And this is kind of the focus of this talk. Um, so the kind of questions I try to ask is that, how can we address these kind of challenges algorithmically? And um, how these uh, quantum mechanical postulates will affect the performance of an algorithm? the quantum device. And ultimately, how can we develop uh, quantum algorithms suitable for these noisy or near-term quantum devices? So here's the outline of this talk. So it's going to be three parts. In the first part, I'm going to talk about tuning and training of quantum uh, computers. Then I'll talk about uh, quantum neural networks. And if time permits, I'm going to talk about some of the fundamental limits when it comes to uh, learning with uh, quantum uh, devices. OK, so let me start with the first part of the talk. Now, generally, in, in many optimization and or also learning problems involving quantum computers, we are dealing with a quantum circuit that is uh, that has a set of parameters to be adjusted. And in these problems that have applications, for instance, in dynamical simulations, finding ground states in photonic circuits, machine learning application, and also combinatorial optimization. In these kind of problems, uh, we are dealing uh, with optimizing the parameters of a quantum circuit uh, in a classical quantum hybrid loop. And this is typically done with an iterative optimization setting. So generally in these problems, um, the model is this optimization where we have an underlying objective function or a loss function where we want to minimize it. And we have a series of parameters A um, that belong to some set D where D is determined by the limitations of the hardware. And we would like to minimize this uh, loss function by adjusting all these parameters. So there are, there are extensive amount of works in this part. And um, uh, people derived uh, different approaches, for instance, gradient approaches or variational algorithms to do this optimization. So one of these uh, approaches that I like to focus on are gradient-based approaches. So let's dive further into this problem. Now, imagine a unitary operator, which basically representing a quantum circuit. And uh, this unitary operator has a set of parameters A. And again, we would like to have this optimization problem. Now, as I mentioned before, the input to the system is going to be a series of quantum states. And at the end, we are going to perform a quantum measurement and we get a classical output. Now, um, we typically assume that the measurement is fixed and the only thing that is to be adjusted is the parameters of this quantum circuit. Now, in order to tune or in order to train this quantum device, we start with a series of training samples, which are basically quantum states with classical labels. And for instance, the quantum states could be a set of d qubit, and therefore the dimension is going to be two power d. And the yi's are representing the desired outcome or the true outcome we would like to achieve. Now, based on this, we can talk about an expected loss. Uh, so which is uh, a loss, which is uh, summed over all the randomness involved. The first line of randomness is randomness in generating the data. And the second line of randomness is due to the internal indeterminism of quantum measurements. So this is this trace quantity. If you look at these trace quantities, essentially the probability that we get an outcome y hat given the input row. 
And this quantity u rho u Hermitian is nothing but the output qubit. And uh, this my hat is the operator corresponding to this measurement. And at the end, since we have classical labels, y and y hat, we can use a classical loss function inside all this expression. So this is the expected loss now. Okay, so now we can talk about the gradient-based methods. So these gradient-based methods have been used extensively in classical problems. And they're used to find the local minima. We know that if the function is convex then local minima gives us global minima. And um, there are also results for non-convex functions including Lipschitz functions and many, many other forms. Typically a gradient distance approach looks like this uh, algorithm here, where we start with an initial point and at each step we calculate the gradient of the function f and then we use this update rule in order to update the parameters. Now let's look at this in a quantum setting. Now let's say this, the parameters are um, a vector of a1 up to ac, so we have c parameters to optimize. And again, this is expected loss. Let's say um, we are looking at the TS iteration. So we have rho t, y t as the input. And this is the expected loss condition on that input. So the only term of randomness is going to be randomness due to the measurement. Now, we would like to do the gradient update on that. So if the gradient of the loss was known, then the gradient update would be something like this, where this eta t is the landing rate, it's a constant that is adjusted. But the issue is here is that um, uh, this loss L is unknown, and this is due to the two main reasons. One is that uh, we cannot even see the samples. So because we can typically in a classical setting, we have the input x, we can look at x, we can compute the function, we can compute the gradient. But in quantum, we cannot see, we cannot even look at the input quantum state because by looking at it, it means that we are performing measurement and therefore we are going to have a state collapse. On top of that, uh, we are dealing with an uh, indeterminism because of the quantum measurements. So this makes the problem more challenging. Now, how can we do the gradient of it? Now let's look at uh, the derivative of the loss in order to gain more intuition about this problem. Now, uh, since this uh, UA is a unitary operator, we can look at its Hamiltonian and we can assume that we can write this U in terms of this quantity. So it's an E power I summation of a series of elementary quantum operations. Let's say these are Pauli matrices. And these ASs are the parameters to be optimized. And this is the expected loss. Now, if we take the derivative of the loss, then we are going to have this series of equations. First, uh, because of the linearity of the trace, the derivative comes inside this expression. And it's not difficult to see that the derivative of this is this uh, expression with respect to A is of this form, where sigma s again is a Pauli operator. And this uh, u rho u Hermitian is nothing but the output qubit, which is rho out. Markson, can you remind me what is sigma s? Sigma s is a Pauli operator. Yeah, you so, didn't say too much about this, so maybe a little bit. Yeah, yeah, we can think of it as an elementary operator, but later on, uh, the, I will uh, exactly say what are these Pauli operators are. Any other question? Okay, so now when we take this uh, derivative, we are dealing an expression of this form. Now again, uh, this expression is unknown because the, the input state is unknown. And uh, because of the stochasticity of the measurement, the output, the classical output is random. On top of that, this is not a, a usual um, uh, term that we see usually in quantum measurements. 
because it's asymmetric. So how, how do we do uh, extra uh, uh, approximations on that? Well, the idea is that one idea that is developed by Fari et al. was that uh, we can take this derivative and we can try to approximate this quantity by asking several copies of example. So the idea is that given any input row, we're gonna, we're gonna have multiple copies of that. We're gonna perform a series of measurement. And then we try to approximate gradient at each data point. So let's say uh, this vector has C component. Then it turns out that we need order of C log C by epsilon S square number of copies per sample in order to approximate the gradient with error up to epsilon. And it's not difficult to see that with T iterations using this approach, we need order of T C log C by epsilon S square. Now the question is that, uh, can we do it with a fewer number of copies? And uh, what about the cases where uh, because of no cloning, we cannot copy the samples. Let's say the samples are inherently quantum coming from a, a quantum system that is not under our control. How can we do that? Well, in this work, we try to answer that by doing kind of a one-shot gradient-based training where we don't use any copy. And um, it turns out that we can even get faster convergence rate. And uh, it's, it's, it's a form of a randomized quantum stochastic gradient descent where with T iteration, we only need order of T samples. So let's look at this idea. Now, again, recall that if we look at the derivative of the loss, we are dealing with an expression of this form. And now I'm going to present a way to measure this quantity. So it consists of a series of steps. In the first step, we are going to have, again, we have this row out here, and this is our unitary operator. We are going to take an auxiliary qubit, and we are going to apply a series of control rotation, which are represented by unitary operator Vs. And then we perform a very specific measurement N, which is a combination of the original measurement M with an additional measurement on the computational basis for the extra qubit. With this measurement, we're gonna get an output y tilde and b, where b is uh, 0, 1, and y tilde is uh, also 0, 1. Then we take this output and perform this classical processing. Basically, we compute this uh, term here, where L is the underlying loss function. So we can think of it as a, a circuit that is attached to the original quantum circuit. And this, uh, the job of this circuit is to measure the derivative of the loss per input sample. Now we can show that uh, this output, this random variable ZT uh, satisfies this property, meaning that uh, the expectation of this random variable Z condition on the input equals to the derivative of the loss. So now we have an on, we have a stochastic random variable, which uh, on expectation gives us the derivative of the loss. I what have a question. <clears throat> what is Z of T? Um, I didn't understand that. Oh, so Z of T is the output of, so we perform this measurement, right? Yes. And then we we calculate this expression. So this measurement has two outcomes, y tilde and b. We take that. We also have the classical label yt, right? Uh, based on these three quantities, we compute this expression. And this is going to be our z of t. It depends on t because the input is rho t and yt. I hope that answers your question. OK. So that would produce the exact, uh, the expectation of that would produce the expectation, uh, the measurement, uh, the, uh, the derivative of the loss function. Exactly, exactly, okay. yes. So this, this whole process, we can think of it as a complicated measurement, 
that uh, gives us a random variable whose expectation equals to derivative of the loss with respect to that input. So this, so this gives us a way to measure the loss without even looking at the input state. And uh, as for the gradient, now um, it's a bit more complicated, but the easy uh, idea is going to be randomly selecting one component at a time and we just update the derivative of that particular component. So now we're going to, let's say, um, select one particular uh, component here, let's say AS, and then we perform this circuit and it's going to give us this random variable and now we create this uh, random vector. And now with this random vector, we can show that uh, the expectation of this random vector condition on the input equals to one over C gradient of the loss at that input. So this was the idea. Now, what about the update rule? Uh, the update rule is now going to be of this form. Now, we modify the gradient update rule. Instead of putting the gradient or approximation of the gradient, we simply put the realization of this random variable z. Sorry, this random vector z. And uh, the update rule is going to be of this form. So because of the randomness here, now all the components here are going to be random. And what happens here is that now instead of uh, estimating the gradient at each point, we output this uh, random vector z, which is not an accurate estimation of the gradient but it statistically pushes the system toward the negative of the gradient over a time interval. And because of uh, the internal randomness due to measurements, now we can talk about the potential randomness because of the hardware. As long as the sources of randomness are going to be unbiased, then, then we can prove convergence rates. And here, for instance, is this result that if the underlying loss function is bounded and convex, then we can show that after t iterations of this uh, update rule, the resulted uh, loss function uh, using this approach is very close to the optimal loss with this convergence rate that uh, drops to zero with the order of one over s square root of t. So this was kind of the idea here. Maybe I should pause for a little bit if there is any question. I have one question. <clears throat> How do you address the <clears throat> the un the this uh, source of randomness in the NISQ? I mean, have you taken that into account in the theorem? Not in the theorem, but there are works uh, that. Uh, I think Holevo has has a paper on this that um, models the sources of models uh, a NISC device. Uh, let's say the the original uh, operator is a unitary operator, so it models it as an another operator E, which attached attaches to U, and this E represents this uh, extra, you know, the the, the imperfections of this uh, device. And um, that E may lead to uh, extra randomness when we do this, all this measurement and all these operations. Okay. And as long as that is on BIOS, this works here. But um, I should say that the constants on the top are going to be larger because of the, and they depend on the amount of the noise and how we model that, but it's probably going to be large. Okay, thanks. Okay, so now let me proceed by comparing to the gradient approximation methods. In order to have a fair comparison, let's say uh, we fix the number of samples and copies. Let's say we, we can only use N samples or N copies. And C is the number of parameters. Now with the randomized quantum stochastic gradient method, the excess loss is going to be order of C by a square root of n. But the, with the gradient approximation, it's going to be order of a square root of 
Phi log C by epsilon and square root of n. Now, if we compare these two expressions, we will see that as long as log C by C is order of epsilon S square, we get faster convergence with uh, Q, randomized QSGD. I know that here that um, this randomized QSGD does not require any copy. And uh, interestingly, it also gives a faster convergence rate as long as the number of parameters are satisfying this property. So let's look at uh, a numerical result. So let's look at, for instance, binary classification of quantum states. Let's say we have this parameterized quantum circuit and um, it has these four parameters. And um, we would like, let's say, to distinguish between a pure state and mixed state. So this is coming from a known data set that uh, has been studied recently by many works. And uh, in, in this setup, now we either have a pure state, which is of this form uh, with uh, phi u by phi u, where u is a parameter, which is each time randomly generated. Let's say we put the label to be zero whenever this is a pure state. And uh, on the other hand, we can have mixed state, let's say with label one, and the mixed state is going to be of this form. Where again, V here is another parameter that is chosen randomly and uniformly. So each sample now is either a mixed state or pure state with probability one third for a pure and two third for mixed states. Now let's take that and let's uh, Run this up to run this uh, uh, randomized QSGD for this device. And here's the graph that we see. Uh, so we have the training loss here as a function of the number of samples that we get over the time. And the red curve is showing the expected loss, which is completed. And the blue dots are the empirical loss we'll see. And the the black curve here at the bottom is coming from a theoretical bound by hollow Wallstrom lower, lower bound. So if we compare now um, the accuracy of prediction at the end of the training, we'll see that QSGD has accuracy very close to this lower bound. And also for the case when, when even the gradient is now. So this is a kind of a verification that we use here. Are there any questions? What is this lower bound? Can you uh, tell us about that? It's, it's, it's based on this whole level of strong lower bound where uh, it's for basically a state discrimination where uh, let's say you, you maximize over all measurements in order to distinguish between uh, two quantum states. So it's based on the one norm distance, the lower bound. Thanks. Yeah, I can I can talk about it later. No, but yeah. Are there any questions? Okay, so this was the first part of the talk. Now, the second part. Now I'm going to talk about quantum neural networks. Now, classical neural networks that have been used in many problems in machine learning are typically of this form. So there are a network of interconnected uh, elements of learning or neurons, uh, which are of this form, where each neuron is kind of have a series of inputs with a series of weights and one activation function. And we can have different activation functions for different classes of neural networks. And the neural network can have several hidden layers and typically at the end of the, uh, at the output layer, we will have uh, one single neuron that making the decisions uh, for us. So similarly, now we can think of quantum neural networks, uh, which are consist of networks of um, a small quantum circuits or quantum perceptrons that are kind of an analog of quantum, analog of activation functions in, in classical neural networks. So here is an example where now the input is going to be uh, quantum, 
then we're going to have a series of small parameterized circuits connected to each other. We can have multiple hidden layers, but at the end, we would like to have a classical answer. So we perform measurements at the output layer, right? So uh, with this setup now, uh, we can talk about quantum neural networks. And this is not a new idea. This has been proposed in 1994 and 1996, and there, there have been several votes since then. And it has applications in classical and quantum machine learning. So now generally in this uh, quantum neural networks, we have some additional challenges. One is due to scalability and the fact that uh, the number of parameters are going to grow exponentially as we add more and more seconds. Another challenge is the well-known barren plateau issue where uh, it states that certain uh, structures of quantum neural networks lead to vanishing gradient uh, after a short while. So it makes it hard for to train a neural net, quantum neural network. So in this work, we try to um, look at the band-limited quantum neural network to control the parameters that they can have and to hopefully use this randomized uh, QSGD in order to train these neural networks. Okay. So before that, let me start with the notion of bandwidth. Uh, bandwidth in classical learning by that, I mean, it's a sort of a notion uh, developed from the Boolean Fourier expansion. So this is a, for, this is a special case of a uh, discrete Fourier expansion, which is developed for uh, functions on Boolean cube. And this has been studied in computational learning. And this gives uh, uh, a notion of nonlinear complexity for Boolean functions. And it's a proxy to drive uh, learning theoretic bounds has applications in feature selection and in information theory and many other problems. So now before talking about the bandwidth in a quantum setting, let me talk about the bandwidth in classical now. So based on this Boolean Fourier, we know that any function G on the Boolean input. So here, instead of zero, one, I'm using plus and minus one. Let's say this G is a function of plus minus one to R. So the Boolean Fourier states that this function can be uniquely represented by this expression. The DGSs are the Fourier coefficients and the KISs are nothing but just the monomials or they're of this one. And the summation ranges over all subsets of the input one to D. So this is a form of a very special form of uh, the Boolean uh, Fourier expansion. Now let's look at an example. For instance, if you look at the logical OR function on two bits, again, plus minus one instead of zero one, then it's not difficult to see that uh, the logical OR function expands of this form. And it's easy to see that the right-hand side satisfies the true stable of this logical OR function when the inputs are plus and minus. So this is a form of, this is a way to, another uh, way to represent Boolean functions in, in, in this Fourier expansion. And this gives a, a lot of um, interesting tools to use in order to analyze these functions. Now, one of these notions based on this uh, Fourier expansion is the, the notion of bandwidth. So how does it work? Well, uh, first we select a K and then here in this summation, we look at all subsets that have k elements, and then we sum over a square of the Fourier coefficients, right? So we get this number wk. And now we can um, draw wk as a function of k and for a given function g. Now, we'll, now we can here, this is, um, we can think of it as a power spectrum for this Boolean function. And now we can, based on this, we can talk about the bandwidth. Okay. How does it compare with the standard Fourier? Well, the standard Fourier has this um, nice duality, which states that, for instance, if you look at the rectangular pulse, 
And if you look at its spectrum using the standard Fourier, then we have this duality that the longer in time the pulse is, the narrower the bandwidth is going to be in the frequency. We have kind of a similar analogy in the Boolean Fourier, meaning that the narrower the bandwidth of the function in the Boolean domain, then the more influenced by the smaller groups of inputs. For instance, on one extreme, we have this simple function, which has a very narrow uh, bandwidth. On the other hand, we have this function, which is uh, XOR of several inputs that has a wider bandwidth. So we have these this nice forms of uh, duality between these two. Now let's go back to quantum. Now again, we have these two classical parts, right? Uh, in quantum, we have the quantum Fourier transform where the Schwarz algorithm, for instance, is based on, and it is of this form. But we would like a sort of a uh, quantum Fourier, which is suitable for operators on qubits, because we want to talk about bandwidths for operators. Uh, how do we model that? Well, it's based on Pauli operators and uh, together with identity. These are the Pauli operators, and Wojtek, this may answer your earlier question. So these operators, together with identity, they form an orthonormal basis. And then it is known that any operator on the Hilbert space of qubits admits this decomposition. So it's based on these Pauli operators, which are tensor together. And the summation ranges over all possible combinations of these D tensor uh, Pauli operators. And these coefficients ASs are complex numbers and are calculated by this simple computation. So Mark and this is for maximally mixed, correct? Uh, this is for maximally mixed, yes. Okay. It's basically, basically, uh, it's basically a sort of a uniform um, input. Okay, so now based on that, we can talk about, again, power spectrum for quantum operators. And we can talk about bandwidths now. So this is going to be the puzzle now. So we have the classical Fourier, its quantum variant, the Boolean Fourier, and its quantum variant based on the Pauli decompositions. Okay, are there any questions? Now, now let's go back to the quantum neural network. Now, if we look at each uh, quantum perceptron inside this quantum neural network, again, it's a unitary operator, and now I can write it in terms of its Hamiltonian by this expression, xp of i of a. And uh, since it acts on a small subsystem by assumption, then we can look at its uh, Fourier expansion with this quantum operate, operation that I told you. So let's say this quantum circuit uh, operates only on coordinate J, where J is a subset of the inputs. Then it's Boolean, it, it, then it's Pauli decomposition is of this form and it is zero outside of this coordinate. So we, this gives us some notion of bandwidth. And uh, the, lar the larger the uh, coordinate is, the larger the bandwidth is going to be. So we can talk about like limiting the bandwidth of this quantum perceptron. And if we do that, we are limiting the number of parameters, which is useful. Uh, and, and based on that, we don't even lose uh, the expressive power because we can show that by setting k equal to two, uh, we can, with enough number of uh, quantum perceptrons, we can uh, model any quantum measurements and basically any form of any quantum neural network or any form of uh, predictor in, in terms of the quantum machine learning perspectives. So this gives us this power and this gives us this control to uh, design quantum neural networks by limiting the number of parameters or or, or limiting the structure of the quantum neural network. Now, let me let me give an example here. Let's say um, 
we would like to distinguish between an entangled and separable states. And let's say each time a quantum state is generated randomly, it's either maximally entangled with probability half, or it is separable uh, with again with probability half. And let's say we take this simple uh, quantum neural network where k is two and m is three, so we have t we, we have three quantum perceptron quantum neurons, and then we basically pad the input, which is consists of only two qubits, with two auxiliary qubits. And each of these quantum neurons are basically of this form. They only have four parameters, right? So, and uh, each time now a sample is drawn based on this expression. Now, if we look at it, now we can train this neural network. And uh, here is the loss versus the number of samples. Again, here we see the expected loss, the empirical loss, and the uh, theoretical lower bound. Again, we see that the, the accuracy that we get is very close to the optimal accuracy. And again, we use this randomized QSGD for, uh, for uh, optimizing this neural network. So this was kind of this part for quantum neural network. Are there any questions? Okay, I think I have a few minutes. Now I can talk about the third part of the talk. Now, the third part of the talk is more on the theoretical limits when it comes to learning in quantum environment. So let's recall that in classical supervised learning, the way the problem is modeled is as follows. First, we have a series of IID labeled samples that are typically generated based on this distribution D and each sample is generated independently of other samples. And typically we have a series of uh, training sets, training uh, samples. And we would like to have an algorithm that uh, find, can predict the label for us. And uh, here the D is typically unknown. Uh, the one general framework for this setup is the agnostic pack framework which is a kind of a distribution free uh, framework. So based on this framework, we have, let's say a concept class. So it's basically a library of choices that we want to compare with. And let's say RPTC is the minimum loss of this class. Then in the agnostic pack, we want to find the learning algorithm such that given the training samples with high probability, it finds a predictor with loss at most epsilon away from the minimum loss of the concept class. And importantly, we want this to hold for any distribution D. So this is, again, this is a distribution free guarantee. And this is a standard uh, uh, framework to study learning theoretic uh, bounds. Now, what a, now with this, now we can talk about sample complexity of concept classes. And there are extensive works uh, for instance, uh, the VC dimension, Rademacher complexity, and many other measures of complexity. Now, what about uh, quantum setting? Now, if you want to talk about quantum setting, now we, we need to talk about the formulations. There are several formulations. Let me briefly give an overview of the current known formulations. One is a set tomography, where in this problem, now the objective is to approximate an unknown quantum state through by uh, doing repeated measurements on multiple copies of this state. And it turns out that for this problem, uh, when the dimension is D, we need order of D square copies. This is another problem which is called a state discrimination, where here in this problem, we don't want to approximate uh, the quantum state, but just we want to check whether this quantum state is close to a known quantum state sigma or it is epsilon far away from, right? So it turns out that we need fewer copies. We need order of t copies. We can think of it as, a, and, uh, as a, the testing problem, the classical problems. We have also 
a lot of other formulations uh, with, with different settings. But one formulation we are interested in is kind of an equivalent of this supervised learning that I just presented, but in a quantum setting. And it is suitable for quantum state classification. So it's kind of a mixture of uh, the, the learning theoretic perspective together with the quantum information theory. Now, the formulation is something like this. So here, we the input features X now is are going to be quantum states, but the label are remaining classical because we can talk about uh, quantum state classification. Because the states are quantum, the labels are classical, the predictors are going to be quantum measurement or essentially POVs. So for instance, um, in the data set that I presented before, now we can think of, let's say, an unknown quantum state, which is entangled, generated with unknown probability, or it can be an unknown separable state with an unknown probability one minus p. Let's say this is our samples. We want to do the classification of that. Where we, th these things are unknown, but we only have access, let's say, to n supervised training sets, right? Row one up to row n. And let's say we choose a measurement m, and this measurement acts on this quantum state and produces us a y hat. So it's a prediction of the label. We would like the prediction of the label be as close as possible to the true label, right? Well, uh, one approach in this criteria is basically a set tomography plus classical machine learning. Where here we try to um, perform a set tomography, give an approximated description of the state, then perform classical machine, classical, uh, machine learning algorithms on the stored density matrices and perform all these operations. The problem with this is that it requires a lot of copies because a set tomography is a very costly operation. Another direction, which is a focus of this work, is based on like a direct learning where, where we like to use VQA, QAOA type of algorithms, where we have a parameterized circuit and we want to tune that, as I mentioned earlier. Now, in this setup, now we can talk about uh, this question, what is the quantum sample complexity or how many samples do we need in order to make sure that we are predicting the label? Well, in order to answer that, we need a, a quantum counterpart of the pack learning model that I presented before. So here is the model. We are going to have an environment. We are going to have an underlying Hilbert space and an underlying set of classical labels. And this environment, which is unaccessible to us, produces a series of samples. And these samples are the training samples. Then we are going to have a quantum algorithm and a CQ, now a quantum measurement concept class, which is the choices of the algorithm. Based on this training set, the algorithm picks one measurement inside this bag and outputs it. For instance, the algorithm can be quantum neural network. How do we test the output of this algorithm? Well, we randomly generated a sample based on the underlying distribution. We pass the quantum state to the measurement and the measurement produces y it hat. And now we can look at y and y hat. We can write its distribution. We can talk about a loss function between y and y hat. And then we can compute the predictor's risk. For instance, we can talk about the misclassification probability between y and y hat, right? So what is a quantum pack now? So the quantum pack is now, is of this form. So we would like to have an algorithm such that given this uh, hypothesis class or concept class CQ, we want this to output with high probability a measurement M whose loss is at most epsilon away from the minimum loss inside the class. And we want this to hold for all possible uh, uh, average uh, feature label states. So 
this corresponds to all possible distributions classically. So uh, it's, a, it's a very similar flavor. So now with this framework, we can talk about quantum sample complexity. Now, before talking about that, let's talk about two special cases. This model that I presented uh, can model the uh, well-known state discrimination problem, for instance. It is also subsumes the classical learning where we look at a very specific structure of quantum states. And obviously in this case, the classical sample complexity and quantum sample complexity are going to be the same. But generally in, in the quantum setting, we have challenges which is specific to quantum. One is that now in this setup that I presented, we have the no cloning principle, meaning that we cannot copy the samples and do the processes. On top of that, uh, whenever we process the samples, we are basically performing quantum measurement and that changes the sample irreversibly in general. And therefore we don't have any sample reuse. And this, is, this is, makes the problem more difficult because all the processes inside this learning setup has to be done once because after that the sample is gone. So we need to make sure that we are using that. Now, um, here, uh, one interesting phenomenon that happens in uh, non-trivial uh, uh, quantum setting is that the quantum sample complexity is going to depend on uh, this unique property which is the compatibility structure of the class. So we prove, for instance, that um, for finite measurement classes, the sample complexity is of this form, where it, it not only depends on the size of the class, but it also on its compatibility structure. So when the class is fully compatible, we recover the classical for results. When it is uh, nolly compatible, then it's going to be uh, even it's going to be much much larger than the other x state. So this is a form that's happening here, and then this raises this question as to whether this standard technique such as VC theory, Rademacher complexity, is applicable here. And uh, I think I have just a couple of minutes, so I'm going to just briefly. Uh, uh, present this uh, simple algorithm, this quantum ERM algorithm. Okay, so ERM algorithm in classical is essentially doing this optimization problem where we, we compute the empirical loss for every uh, choices of the choices of functions. And it turns out that the sample complexity is of this form. But in quantum, the problem is more difficult because let's say we want to calculate or find the empirical loss of one measurement. Again, we know that we have to do this as a quantum measurement. So the empirical loss itself has to be measured. And um, yeah, sure, it, it can be done with this measurement. But then the question is that after measuring this empirical loss, the samples are going to be collapsing. Now, this raises this question, how can we now measure the empirical loss for multiple predictors using the same set of samples? Well, the answer relates to this measurement compatibility or joint measurability. And, uh, and uh, that, that's why this uh, compatibility structure comes into the place because some of the measurements are going to be compatible with each other and some are, aren't going to be like that. And uh, so this has to be taken into account for the ERM. So we're going to have a modified quantum ERM that tries to cover this set of samples with uh, this compatible covering. So here I'm, I'm going to skip this other part due to lack of the time. And um, so just to wrap up, so I talked about uh, physically realizable quantum algorithms to address some of the challenges in quantum computers. Uh, I talked about uh, quantum stochastic gradient descent, quantum neural network, and the quantum sample complexity. And with that, I finish my talk.